This is Lab Medicine Rounds, a curated podcast for physicians, laboratory professionals, and students. I'm your host, Justin Kreuter, the Bowtie Bandit of Blood, a transfusion medicine pathologist at Mayo Clinic. Today, we're rounding with Dr. Jorge Torres Mora, Assistant Professor of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic. Dr. Torres Mora is an anatomic pathologist and program director of the Bone and Soft Tissue Pathology Fellowship at Mayo Clinic. Thanks for joining us today. Hey, thank you very much, uh, Justin. Uh, thank you for inviting me. This is, uh, I feel honored, uh, uh, and I think it's a very relevant, very uh, uh, currently uh, hot topic in molecular in pathology. I'm happy to be here, and hopefully I can, uh, uh, I can help to spread a little bit more of uh, awareness of this uh, 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 discipline. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's exactly what we're going for is this kind of blending on how do we think about anatomic pathology, but then also all this molecular information. Maybe you can kick us off with kind of, you know, why is molecular information important for you and your practice to integrate in anatomic pathology? Oh, sure, definitely. That's, that is a great question. Of course, you know, nowadays with all these molecular advances, the field of pathology is completely different to what it was only, let's say, a decade ago, right? So many new uh, discoveries, so many new technologies, and we are doing a good job incorporating them into the clinical practice. So uh, the molecular uh, pathology is important for me as a pathology, as a diagnostician for several reasons, but I would uh, uh, say three important things. One is diagnosis, which is what I do. That's my main job. I diagnose what a tumor is, et cetera. Is benign, malignant, what subtype, what lineage. Uh, the other important thing that is a little bit more uh, helpful for the clinician is uh, therapeutic and prognostication, right? Uh, I can tell you a little bit about more uh, of, of every every one of those uh, reasons. You know, diagnostic, for instance, we are uh, uh, lucky nowadays to have one extra layer of uh, verification for our diagnosis. In the past, it was a uh, okay unusual tumor, not very uh, not very uh, specific for uh, it doesn't fit in a specific box. So I don't know what it is. I think is this. Other people, other experts would say, I, I think is the other thing. Other experts would say a different thing. Nowadays, we have an extra layer of, of information that we can incorporate. We can do a molecular a technique and we can tell us uh, that they can tell us, uh, oh, you know what? This has a specific fusion. And then, oh, pathologist one, two, or three uh, it has the right answer. This fusion is diagnostic for such a such a specific entity. So. Uh, that's one reason, uh, more accuracy in diagnosis. Second reason is, you know, we are discovering uh, nowadays that what we thought the normal morphologic spectrum of some tumors is actually wider than we initially believe, right? We see that, for instance, recently we have seen a couple of of cases. Uh, I, I give you one example of many extraskeletal mixed sarcoma, a very classic. Uh, a malignant tumor, but with a protractive a clinical course, you know, nowadays we are seeing cases that look a high grade spindle cell sarcomas. And then you look at it and you wouldn't think this is a skeletal mixture of sarcoma until you do the, the, uh, the molecular and you, you find the characteristic fusion or characteristic uh, gene rearrangement. And you say, oh, wait a minute, let me go back to that slide. And then yes, yeah, sure enough, in retrospective, you go back and look at those little foci in between the high-grade tumors that look like classic extraskeletal mix of sarcoma, right? So it's, it's very important for us to expand in, in you know, the spectrum, the true spectrum of tumors, another layer of verification and, and further, you know, expand our knowledge about tumors. Uh, uh, the other reason, you know, Recently, uh, one of the best examples is uh, a, the small round blue cell tumors. You know, Ewing sarcoma, one of the most common uh, small round cell sarcomas in kids, if not the most. Uh, in the past, everything was Ewing sarcoma or Ewing light sarcoma, right? Nowadays, with the, all these uh, 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 
availability of molecular techniques, we are seeing that uh, the tumor that in the past we used to call U-wing lysarcomas are actually a very heterogeneous group of tumors that have different uh, molecular alterations, a different prognosis, different response to treatment, and, and it's not just a single entity. So that's very useful uh, you know, for the clinicians, for uh, for the parents to know what what to expect, this tumor is going to respond to you in therapy or not, etc. Uh, for a variety of reasons, and lately, you know, uh, therapeutic um, therapeutic is 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 so important. You know, with all this uh, uh, precision targeted uh, treatment on, uh, uh, for a variety of, of of tumors, I can tell you many of them. But one of the most, uh, you know. Uh, successful stories we heard of lately is the entrecomas, right? One of those uh, uh, tissue agnostic treatment, right? Like the, the, the clinicians can treat locally advanced or metastatic NTRK rearranged tumors, regardless of what we see on the slide. They are trying to get rid of us in a way, but <laughs> hopefully it doesn't happen in my lifetime. But, but it's one of those things that, uh, uh, you know, if we tell them, listen, this tumor has an NTRK1 rearrangement, they can treat it with NTRK inhibitors and the patient can respond wonderfully. Uh, and is that just one story of many others? Uh, I think we are, we are uh, in the early stages, but I hope in the, in the near future, uh, these uh, stories become more and more and more uh, frequent and everybody can have, you know, a very specific tailored treatment to, to a specific tumor, a specific person. Yeah, and I, I like how you're highlighting how this is really made and really continues to reinvent pathology really in the tip of the sphere for, you know, what's what's the accurate, you know, diagnosis, uh, therapeutic we should use, what kind of prognostic information. You've really articulated that. Something else in your answer that I just wanted to pull out here and maybe ask a follow-up question. You're talking about, you know, this is something that, you know, in the last 10 years really has, has been a, a revolution. And so something I'm interested in, um, because, um, you know, interested in how do we learn new information, because I imagine that, uh, you know, you could say, well, you know, there's a lot of molecular information that's come out new, but, you know, I'm, I'm sitting here focused on uh, my morphology or something. But how did you recognize that, that molecular information uh, was really a critical competency for you to develop as an anatomic pathologist? Because this, this has happened during your career so far. Yes, exactly, exactly. And, and I can tell you, you know, even uh, like I said, uh, 10 years ago, I was in a, in a different hospital, a, a, a very big a, a cancer center a, doing my fellowship there. And, and we didn't even have the availability of fish for MDM2 for well differentiated aposarcomas, which now, uh, nowadays is almost unthinkable not to have it, right? So uh, yes, I have kind of um, my career uh, has been developed along the new discovery so, uh, uh, of molecular. So I have seen this uh, evolution along my, my, my relatively short career. It is, is very important. So how do I recognize it? Well, it is, it's kind of impossible not to uh, in the place we were, right? We work with, uh, with so many different teams and colleagues uh, that are always up to date trying to find what's the best uh, for the patient, what's out there, what's new. And then uh, 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 that's very important. They call me, hey, listen, uh, uh, the oncologist, for instance, they tell me, uh, uh, what about uh, 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 what about this, uh, 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 you know, imatinib for, for Gs? Is this, uh, is this Gs a, a kid mutation or not? It's just a, a, a uh, example of many. Mm -hmm. uh, so that make me, you know, oh, let me look into that. Let me, let me see what's out there. Uh, what can we do to, to, to tell you this particular tumor has a kid mutation or not? Then I go and uh, uh, ask my molecular colleagues, right? My, the molecular, I don't do molecular. I'm just, a, a, I'm not part of that select group of smart people. I just do whatever they come up with. But every time I have a question, I go ask him, hey, listen, what do I have? I want to prove this tumor has a kid mutation. What do I do? So they tell me, okay, go do the G-spanel. I'm going to test, 
you know, mutation for the exon so and so. We're gonna test for PDGFR alpha. We're gonna test for SDHV, etc. So uh, first of all, uh, going back to your question, uh, the other uh, colleagues always push you, uh, especially here at Mayo Clinic, to be a, a, a the advance in the front edge of the most recent advances, right? The other thing, uh, um, you know, my colleagues, my other pathology colleagues who, that, that do similar things that I do, there is always communication, sharing of cases, uh, and I learn from them, right? The most senior colleagues, they all, also from the more juniors, you know, that we exchange information and, and you know, we share cases and, and, and stories, you know, like, uh, I have a similar case and I did this and I contacted this and this, I have this new paper, I went to this course, et cetera. So uh, it's, it's a, a group effort where you have to be uh, uh, always uh, alert and try to, to be up to date to, to see what's out there. I see. And so, um, you know, so I like that you're highlighting colleagues both within, you know, your team as well as outside. And, and as I hear you, you know, starting to pick up, you know, what are people interested in? What are your, uh, uh, you know, the oncologists talking about? That's been a driver, uh, as well as conversations, it sounds like, during your, um, you know, pathology conferences with them. Do you find yourself going to different uh, sessions then when you go to conferences? Are you specifically kind of paying attention to ones that have a molecular thread through them? No, no. Uh, uh, I try to, uh, well, first of all, you know, uh, 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 we go to, you know, interdisciplinary conferences here uh, that are more focused on what I do, right? The, the bone and soft tissue uh, with my colleagues, you know, the interdisciplinary uh, groups, the, the, the uh, orthopedic oncologists, right? We have every Thursday morning, we have a, a, a joint conference with other services, radiology, uh, you know, oncologies, uh, uh, radiation uh, oncologies, etc. Uh, we all get together and and they present cases. And at the end, they they nice they give a very nice little summary of what's out in the literature. And we all get to pitch in, or or, or you know, if somebody has a question for a specific uh, um, a specific. A discipline a specific specialty somebody answers and that's that's how you learn and, uh, from your colleagues and now from uh, you know the outside uh, all, also the outside conferences you know uh, I don't go to a specific molecular uh, I try to go you know mostly virtual you know uh, morphology uh, in general because I do a lot of general uh, surgical pathology and and there is a little bit of everything uh, uh, morphology immunohistochemistry molecular in every single one of them so basically you put everything together you know uh, uh, and then you integrate and and adopt what your colleagues need and what you think it is important Mm, I see. And so what do you think uh, for our audience, right, which is a mix of uh, students, clinicians, laboratory professionals, uh, how do you recommend that we all kind of continue to embrace new opportunities in clinical practice? Well, I guess the most important thing, uh, Justin, is to create uh, channels of communication with, with your colleagues, with your other, the other teams. If you don't create those channels of communication, you are not, you're gonna be caught up of the, of the most, you know, cutting edge technology, what your, your, your colleagues need from you, you're gonna be stuck in the past. So uh, most important thing is create relationships, communicate with them. What, what do you want from me? What do you need? We sometimes, you know, uh, I try to ask my colleagues, hey, what do you need in your, my report? Is this enough for you? Do you want me to do any specific test that is going to help you? Sometimes, uh, uh, you know, uh, not every molecular test is helpful for them. Uh, uh, so we have to be aware that, you know, not to uh, uh, waste resources, right? Uh, uh, so it's, it's a constant communication. But I would say that, uh, uh, the communication with your clinical colleagues and your own interest to keep yourself up to date, uh, what's out in the literature to what your, your other, you know, uh, hospitals, leading hospitals doing, 
uh, uh, is very important. Uh, of course, uh, you know, very uh, important to keep in mind that you are here, the main reason are the patients and the better you do, the, the better you do your job, the most the, the, the patients are gonna uh, uh, benefit or, or and it's gonna give you more satisfaction and fulfillment, you know, that's why we, we are here. You know, I'm kind of struck by, you know, how you, you're you talking about setting up these channels of communication. Uh, I'm kind of curious, how has this changed or has it how, has it changed since you started practice? You know, we're talking about how molecular has kind of come down the pike and really been something new that's added onto your practice. Is this importance of channels of communication? How has it changed in recent years, do you think? Well, you know, you uh, I, I think... I think it may be just my imagination, but I think uh, in the past, uh, at least when I was a fellow, a resident, uh, uh, a, a lot of times it's like the pathologists just tell them what it is, uh, and then the clinician decides what to do, uh, you know, because you just tell them the diagnosis and just a diagnosis, and, and you don't offer a too much more information, right? Of course, prognostication is always important and, and the morphology is enough to prognosticate sometimes. But nowadays there are so many things that as a pathologist we can offer, you know, like I said, uh, therapeutic implications, uh, new entities that in the past we didn't know about and we are starting to create uh, new, you know, classifications, new uh, 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 schemes. Uh, so it is, I think the pathologists nowadays uh, have way more to offer, not only diagnostic, again, therapeutic and, and prognostication, even, even more than in the past. Wow. So it sounds like that communication has always been a constant, but has gotten more complex in recent years. Exactly, exactly, way more complex. And that's a good point. You, you, you're right, hitting the nail right there because uh, there is so uh, complex is the word, uh, so much information out there, so many new uh, discoveries every day that it's hard to keep up. Now, you have to work with your colleagues to filter what's important, what's clinically significant, what's going to help the, the patient, basically what is signal and what is uh, through signal, what is background noise, right? So for that, you cannot do it with, by yourself. You need the, the help of your colleagues uh, and a good team effort. Wow, that's been wonderful. So we've been rounding with Dr. Torres Mora. Thank you for taking the time to talk about molecular in anatomic pathology and really on this theme of talking about uh, complexity and communication. Awesome. It, it has been my pleasure and uh, I'm available. You guys have my uh, contact information. If anybody has any interest, uh, will be uh, my pleasure to, to, to talk about it. Thank you. And, you know, if you, our audience, would like to hear more on this topic, be sure to register for the Virtual Surgical Pathology Symposium 2022, where our very own Dr. Torres Mora will be presenting cases on bone uh, soft tissue. Uh, this conference is being held on May 13th, so check the show notes for the link to register. To all of our listeners, thank you for joining us today. We invite you to share your thoughts and suggestions via email. Please direct any suggestions to mcleducation at mayo.edu and reference this podcast. If you've enjoyed Lab Medicine Rounds podcast, please subscribe. Until our next rounds together, we encourage you to continue to connect lab medicine and the clinical practice through insightful conversations. Thank you.